Oh, hey, me. <laughs> Unexpected. This is a lay person. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the BioBasics lecture. I'm Judy Gasson, and I first of all want to thank the people who made this event possible today. To the Research Administrators Campus Committee, we certainly wouldn't be able to do the important work that we do here without your support. Thanks to the UCLA Development Community and the Office of Research Administration, also equally important to the work that we're doing here. And I'd like to thank Dion and Rosalie, who do such a fine job of putting this together and advertising it and getting lunch for us all. So we're happy to see you here. I'm really, uh, I love this series of lectures, and I'm really enthusiastic about today's lecture. It's my colleague, Dr. Peter Butler, and he's chief of endocrinology here in the Department of Medicine at UCLA, and he's also the director of the Larry Hillbloom Islet Research Center at UCLA. And Peter is a brilliant scientist. He takes wonderful care of patients, and he's been responsible for recruiting many fine faculty here to UCLA to enhance our diabetes program. As a as an individual, I'm very concerned about the epidemic of, of diabetes and the effect that it's having on our population and on the future. And I'm really happy and very gratified to see that so many members of our community are equally concerned and are interested to come here today and find out what's going on in the area of research. As you'll quickly learn, Peter received his early training in Birmingham, Edinburgh, and Newcastle in Great Britain. And he was subsequently recruited to the Mayo Clinic, which we're grateful for because that got him to the United States. He traveled from the Mayo Clinic to USC, and then we were able to recruit him here to UCLA in 2002 to establish the Hillbloom Center and to lead the division of endocrinology. He is a witty, very intelligent, a great colleague, and I'm, I'm certain that you're going to enjoy his presentation today. So please join me in, in welcoming Dr. Peter Butler. Thank you so much for the warm and kind introduction, and I think it's appropriate to also thank the research administrators, the research development team of you amongst here on behalf of those of us who are doing research, we're really grateful to you for all that you do and uh, that you are the engine room that allows those of us who um, uh, do research to function. And also, I want to acknowledge that this is Dr. Gasson's uh, at last uh, swan song as the director of the Johnson Cam uh, Cancer Center and the director of research here at UCLA, David Geffen School of Medicine. And she has been a phenomenal um, kind uh, leader with care and interest in faculty, and I think I would like us to put our hands together and thank her in this, this room for all that she has done. <laughs> Judy, we'll miss you, but you're always welcome back. So thank you. So um, why are you here? And I guess that's the first slide. And maybe it's the free lunch, maybe you have diabetes, maybe you have a family member with diabetes, perhaps you're in the wrong room. These are all um, the reasons I've been in lecture rooms before. Well, I don't have diabetes yet, but quite often I've uh, been in the wrong room. So the question I posed was asked to address is, why is there a diabetes epidemic? And somebody up in CHS answered the question for me, and the poster was returned to me. And I censored the poster, because I knew it was going to be recorded. <laughs> So, um, I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with whoever defaced my poster, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so let me begin. There are at least two types of diabetes. There's more than just the form of diabetes that the author of this poster uh, had in mind. Before the 1930s, people with type 1 diabetes died, always died died a horrible death, a slow, over the course of about a year, wasting death. 
And one of the great miracles of modern medicine is that these patients now have a normal life expectancy, not a normal life, but a normal life expectancy. This is the form of diabetes, childhood diabetes, it's often occur referred to, but it occurs at any age, that requires insulin therapy from the get-go for you to stay alive because the cells that make insulin have been unfortunately destroyed by an, your immune system mistakenly. And this image shows you on the, on the far left a, a little girl who was going to die shortly of the disease. You see how she's wasted, has no muscle, no fat left. Uh, she would have been dead within weeks, but the miracle of the first insulin became available. And there you see her in the middle picture after she's been receiving insulin and she lived into her adult life. I'm not going to talk about type 1 diabetes much today, but since we have a lot of development officers here, it is a very exciting field at the moment in terms of breakthrough, because thanks to some tremendous work at university, at, uh, uh, by the Chair of Developmental Biology at Harvard, Doug Melton, we now have the capacity to take skin biopsies from patients, turn them into to stem cells and advance them into the islets for patients with diabetes in 60 days. That process is going to have some barriers yet to get through, but I'm going to predict that within five years, we will not, patients injecting themselves with insulin with type 1 diabetes will no longer need to do so. Um, and it's a big deal. If you have a kid who has type 1 diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Sticking your finger four or five times a day to measure your blood sugar, um, a little girl of this age is going to have to do that 500,000 times in their life if we don't advance the care of diabetes, inject themselves with insulin four or five times a day. So most of the time I'm going to talk about type 2 diabetes, the so-called adult onset diabetes that the person who contributed to the poster was referring to. And I'm going to start with a picture I took in 1979 in India. This little fellow is helping dad in the paddy field in Punjab, and I was on a child health care program um, as a medical student in, in Ludhiana, India. And India is one of the uh, areas of the world where there's this huge advance in this type 2 diabetes epidemic now. Also China, Korea, Japan, United States, 35 million people here. So we have a, a, a huge epidemic, and a lot of it is to do with our lifestyle and the westernization of our lifestyle, our urbanization. So maybe this is what the little boy grew up to. Now, he's sleep deprived, he's sitting in front of a whole bunch of computers, uh, he's not exercised to the extent he did when he was with dad, and it speaks to some of the risk factors for type 2 diabetes. So yes, obesity and sedentary, but, oh, thank you so much, appreciate it. I press this, you will disappear, apparently, no? There you go. So obesity and sedentary lifestyle is a risk factor. Sleep disruption is a risk factor. If you don't get eight hours of sleep a night, you are at high risk of type 2 diabetes. Any, anyone else in there? Um, pregnancy, it's not my issue right now. Chronic liver disease, glucocorticoids, that's steroids, family history, and then persistent organic pollutants. So my objective is to try to run through some of these and see how this is leading to our, uh, our increasing epidemic. So let's start with the obesity, because that's what our, our, our poster adjustment uh, was focused on. And you've all seen this slide. Two th 1994, blue colors of states that with a low prevalence of obesity. And by 2010, many, many states are up to 30% of people who are obese. And perhaps most scary now is about 30% of children in many of those states are obese. Um, so this is a huge change over a relatively short period of time. Are we all just eating too much? Are we all just lazy f asses or whatever it was saying in that thing? <laughs> well, it's not just that. This is one of the biggest risk factors, and some of you may recognize this freeway. Some of you may, in fact, have been photographed in that freeway. <laughs> the longer you spend on a commute, the more likely you are to get diabetes. That's been shown very clearly. The more likely you are to be obese. And many of our cities have been designed in such a way, or uh, have happened in such a way that this problem is a big deal. If you spend an hour and a half stuck in traffic getting home, you're pretty motivated for a, just to some, grab some food and, and just really relax. So this is a big local problem, and this is a major contributor to obesity, because when you're sitting in that car, you're not exercising, and oftentimes you're eating some food. 
the amount of food that's presented to us has gone up dramatically. So this shows you now what fries were at McDonald's in 2000, excuse me, 1955. Now, small fries is the same, but if you get medium, large, or super, look how many more you get. A soda, 1955, for an adult, is now half of what it is for a child, and most people probably go to large, which is four or five times larger. So the size of portions, and those of you who've come from other countries, the United States, like I did, are pretty taken aback by what's put in front of you initially when you first arrived. Now I think it's perfectly reasonable, but when I first came here, I thought it was, it was enormous, but I became enormous even. So obesity and sedentary lifestyle, it's a factor. It's, a lot of it's to do with our lifestyle, stuck in traffic, our, our food that's put in front of us, the type of food that's put in front of us. People interested in food sciences point out also that the foods we shouldn't be eating have got substantially cheaper during the last 20 years, and the foods we should be eating have got substantially more expensive during the last 20 years. So fruits and vegetables are more expensive, whereas uh, calorific foods are, are cheaper. And that's a big issue for people living um, on, a, on a lower uh, wage. So what about uh, sleep? Where does that come in? So here's a rather pretty picture taken from the space station looking down over the northeast coast, and you can see all the lights of the northeast there. I think you can see Baltimore and, and Philadelphia. And in fact, this is our own city at night. You may recognize the sky, skyscrapers. And here's a, an interesting equivalent of the obesity map showing you the United States light uh, at night in the late 50s, middle 70s, 97, 2025. It's hard to get away from light at night. Um, and that's an issue because we are supposed to be circadian animals that are supposed to be in the dark at night and in the light during the day. Um, and then there's a, probably the worst enemy of all of this, many of you will recognize, is this. All right? Waiting for Dr. Gasson's email to come in saying, you have got that pay rise, right? <laughs> Still waiting, Judy. One day left. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you do this, you are telling your brain it's broad daylight. If you look at your iPhone at night, if you look at your laptop, if you look at your iPad, you are telling the retina, there are some cells at the back of your retina that pick up blue light that determines that it's daytime. And it suppresses all the hormones that you're supposed to secrete at night, such as melatonin. And so we are meant to be on a global dark light cycle and the eye sends the signal back through the suprachiasmic nucleus to the pineal gland, secretes melatonin, and the melatonin then synchronizes the clocks in all of your other tissues, your liver, your bladder. And <clears throat> this, is, this is very important. The reason you feel awful when you step off that plane in Tokyo or London is not just United Airlines. Quite a lot of it's United Airlines. <laughs> but <clears throat> it's also because your body clocks are now completely screwed. Your liver thinks it's the middle of the day and it's the middle of the night. You may remember, you, those of you who've done this know that you find yourself getting up all the time to uh, go to the bathroom because your bladder has a circadian rhythm. It gets flaccid during the night, expands, and lets you have more urine stored. When you're jet lagged, you keep jumping out. Even when you're trying to sleep, you keep waking up because your bladder is half the size it should be. So every organ has these biological clocks. And the melatonin synchronizes them. And if you <laughs> look at how the islets of Langerhan and the pancreas respond, they greatly require that nighttime melatonin. If you look at your laptop at night, you suppress the melatonin. And so <clears throat> these are the sorts of reasons why there's an a, a increased risk of diabetes in folks who are doing shift work. And a lot of this work was done here at UCLA by young Alexei Matvienko here. Uh, Alexei was a... Um, I'm proud to say UCLA trained, and it was a young faculty member here, now has an endowed chair at the Mayo Clinic, and is carrying on this work. And Alexei uh, was able to show us and report some beautiful studies that indicated that the <coughs> light at night suppressed melatonin secretion increases the risk of diabetes by causing the islets of Langerhan that make your insulin and keep you from having diabetes to be abnormal. And other studies are showing you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and indeed neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, if you don't get the night uh, time darkness that you should and sleep. So this is a very important area. 
I think it's an area that's going to be growing a lot in, in the biological sciences over the next few years. So for those of you in development administration, I think this is a spot to keep an eye on. And given the fact that UCLA is strong in sleep studies and strong in neurodegeneration and cancer, I think this is an a area of a fertile for further uh, investigation at UCLA. So, <clears throat> so much for the, <clears throat> for the sleep uh, and obesity pattern. I think that's a big part of the epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Uh, what about pregnancy, chronic liver disease, glucocorticoids? Well, to deal with that, I'm, gonna, I, I'm deliberately not going to do too much biology here, but I am going to just take you a little bit back to some simple glucose metabolism. So why do we have glucose in the circulation? Well, if you don't, you're unconscious because your brain absolutely needs glucose. You're, we have about 14 hormones keeping our blood sugar up. We only have one bringing it down, and that tells you something about how important it is we keep the glucose sufficient for our brain to function. Three o'clock in the morning, hopefully, you're fast asleep. You're burning about 200 milligrams of sugar every minute. 100 milligrams is being used by your brain. 100 milligrams is being used by the rest of your body. So if it wasn't for the fact that you were making sugar and putting it into your blood during the night, your blood sugar would drop, 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 and you would be in big trouble. Fortunately, you have a liver, and your liver makes 200 milligrams of sugar every minute during the night and replaces the sugar that's been taken out of your blood. So for the liver to do that, it presumably is getting some information about how much it should make, and that's where the pancreas comes in. It's about the size of your hand, lies in the back of your abdomen, on, the back, on your backbone. Most of what it's doing is making digestive juices and digesting your food. But scattered around in it, there are about one million little groups of cells that I tell patients are like thermostats. They're measuring the blood sugar and they're releasing hormone insulin in these little bumps. Every four minutes, you release a squirt of insulin into your portal vein, into your liver. And this serves as a break. It slows down the release of sugar from your liver. So this is a very simple feedback loop. That whatever the prevailing glucose is, you make insulin, slows this down. So if you eat your Frosties in the morning, you have more glucose in your blood, you make more insulin, you turn off this arrow, the sugar comes back to normal. You go for a run, you burn more sugar, the sugar drops, the insulin drops, your liver makes more sugar. This is how the system's supposed to work. Um, some of the insulin gets through the liver and goes to your muscle and helps to store glucose in there. So the way insulin works then is reducing sugar release from the liver, helping sugar to be taken up and stored here in your muscles, and <coughs> Here's where these various risk factors for diabetes kick in. If you have liver disease, then you need more insulin to turn off the release of sugar from the liver. And also, if you're overweight, you have more fat in the liver, a so-called fatty liver, and it makes it harder for the insulin to turn off the release of sugar. If you have to take steroids for asthma, sarcoid, a transplant, that's where these work. And during pregnancy, there's an adaptive period. During the last third trimester of pregnancy, the baby grows fast. Mum doesn't want to grow at the same speed, right? So mother eats 1,000 calories, and she wants 900 to go to the baby, not if she grows at the same speed as the baby, she's going to be unhappy mother. So it's an adaptive insulin resistance. And then you need, <laughs> if your muscles, if you're uh, sleep disrupted, even one night of sleep disruption, you don't sleep well tonight, tomorrow morning you will be insulin resistant. So that's where those risk factors kick in. But there's, there's an important caveat here. Many causes of insulin resistance. So does that cause diabetes? Well, no. Because 80% of you in this room, if you became very insulin resistant for any reason, what would happen is your islets in your pancreas would say, OK, I'll make more insulin. And you'd just make enough insulin to keep the liver attuned. So in contrast to the poster we started with, the great majority of people who are overweight or on steroids or pregnant or don't sleep well don't get diabetes. 80% just adapt and make more insulin. About 20% of us in this room, however, if insulin resistant, the islets say, to heck with this, too much work, and they don't make as much insulin as required. And so the liver says, oh, I guess the sugar must be low, and it makes much more sugar, and that's the basis of diabetes. 
So with that background, <coughs> it tells us that if we want to understand what causes type 2 diabetes, we need to go and look at the, lip, the eyelids and figure out what's going wrong. So just <coughs> to tell you that it's not a very convenient thing to do, your pancreas looks like this, sits on your backbone here. Not many of you would be willing to let me get a piece of your pancreas, not unless you were very drunk. <coughs> Here's your eyelets of Langerhans and a nice hand drawing from my Mayo days. You have about one million of these scattered around your pancreas. Langerhan, by the way, was a German medical student who found these. And he wrote an apology in the front of his thesis saying he was sorry his research proved to be rather unimportant modesty. And he died of tuberculosis as a consequence of his research because dissecting the cadavers in those days, many of them had tuberculosis. And he caught it and was dead by 29. So I'm glad we named these after him. If you look at an independent islet and stain it for insulin here, there are two to 3,000 of these purple cells in each of your islets that make insulin and secrete insulin. These are the thermostat measuring the blood sugar. And if we take it one step further down, here's what it looks like at electron microscopy. Each of these little black dots here is insulin in a crystal waiting to be fired into this capillary. Here's the nucleus. Here's all the mitochondria for the mitochondria core that's about to be developed. And here's the, <coughs> this is what your beta cells do. And your beta cells, like your brain cells, pretty much last all your life. And each beta cell makes insulin, makes about 20 million insulin molecules a day and secretes them. So these are really busy, busy and they need a lot of energy, a lot of mitochondria. And <coughs> that speaks to, to some extent as to why they're vulnerable. So <coughs> one of the breakthroughs in this field, I'm proud to say, was from she who I obey, from my wife, because having established that the islet seemed to be a problem when I was <coughs> initially working in this area, I was fortunate enough to marry Alex, who was a pathologist and also remarkably patient and therefore still married to me 30 years later. And I said, why don't you look at the pancreas of people who have type 2 diabetes and see what the heck's going on. Here she is, still smiling. <coughs> <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so <coughs> here's the islet in health again on the top. And here's what an islet looks like in someone with type 2 di diabetes at the bottom. And I think you probably can tell it ain't normal. There's a big difference. And what Alex was able to report was that there's about a 60 to 70% deficit in the number of cells, beta cells, in people with type 2 diabetes. This is a tough study, getting pancreases from people with diabetes versus non-diabetes matched. It's up to 1,000 citations now, so it's rather an important uh, publication. And <coughs> this set off um, uh, an inquiry as to why are people with type 2 diabetes losing the cells that make insulin? There's a lot less of these purple cells down here. Plus, it had been known for a long time that this material here called amyloid was there and should not to be there. And why was it there? And what was it made of? Two groups in 1989 were able to establish what the protein was made of. It turned out to be made of a protein that gets co-secreted along with insulin when you eat your food. And <clears throat> another young investigator who trained here and very proud of has made tremendous uh, contributions to this area. Safia Cost, now at the University of Montpellier, who was here for six or seven years. The lovely Safia did some really important and elegant studies in understanding how IPP, this protein, islet amyloid polypeptide, uh, forms <coughs> uh, the kinds of materials you see outside the cells in that earlier picture. I promised not to be too scientific, but this is an amino acid sequence of what IPP looks like in humans at the top. And where there's a dot, it's the same in the other species, monkeys, cat, mouse, rat here. And the point I'm making is that it's very similar between species, except in this area here where there are differences. And the pink area is the area that gives this protein the capacity to form, um, stick to each other, form what's called oligomers, and then ultimately form these big uh, protein deposits called amyloid. And interestingly, Humans, monkeys, and cats develop type 2 diabetes. If you have a pet cat, it's overweight. It's got a 20% chance of getting type 2 diabetes. If you have a pet monkey, good luck. <laughs> so if you're a mouse or a rat, you don't develop diabetes. They have these prolines in here. They're soluble, and they don't get diabetes. So we're getting pretty molecular, Mr. Defacer of Poster, who thinks it's all to do with me being a fat whatever. If I don't have these peptide these particular amino acids here, I don't get this disease. It's got a molecular basis. So <clears throat> obviously it became interesting to take the 
human gene and stick it into mice and rats. And I have to, an aside there, you'll be entertained. I remember my son was about 10 at the time, and I was very proud because, yay, we, we succeeded and we made rats that developed type 2 diabetes with the same kind of islet phenotype. And he said, great, so you've managed to create diabetes in a species that never had it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's progress, you know. <laughs> Aren't you meant to be trying to get rid of diabetes in a species that does have it? And so I guess that was from the mouths of babes. He went into law. <laughs> Argumentative and so forth. Anyway, so then we were able to create these models, and these have been very useful, because yes, if we put that protein in here, we can have these cells develop the same kind of diabetes as, as humans, and it's easier to get pancreas from animals. And so someone else I'm very proud of, and I'm delighted to stay, is still here at UCLA, is Tatiana Grolo, who had made very important progress in understanding what form these particular uh, protein deposits take to cause cells to be sick inside the cells. And I'll simply show you another electron micrograph um, here to show you the kind of thing. This is a human beta cell. So here's mitochondria, here are insulin crystals, and black dots are dots showing you where this protein IPP that tends to form these abnormal oligomers are. And what Tatiana showed was that these form inside cells, inside pancreatic beta cells, in people who are developing type 2 diabetes. And in the process, they damage the mitochondria. And that's become a very exciting and important area of research. So there's someone else here who takes huge credit for making a really, the, I think, most exciting breakthrough in the field of uh, diabetes. Um, and, and that's David Eisenberg, who is... Uh, a Howard Hughes investigator in, the, in chemistry here. And what David's group did was they took on the very tough task. So David Eisenberg is a world famous uh, chemist in terms of understanding the structure of the amyloid proteins. But much more importantly, from our perspective, he took on the task of figuring out what is the structure of the oligomers that are causing the damage. And uh, David Eisenberg's group uh, identified at least one of the more important forms of this uh, that they call cylindrins, and it's a hexamer of these uh, oligomers. And what's really interesting is it does, it's the same whether it's Alzheimer's or type 2 diabetes or Parkinson's, all these proteins that are characterized by so-called protein misfolding. These uh, proteins that have the propensity to form amyloid deposits get, assemble in this cylindrin structure within membranes and cause the membranes to become destabilized. So again, in terms of the repertoire of research being done here at UCLA, for those of you in administration and development, here's another example of some really fundamental science underpinning the basis of many important diseases. So <clears throat> to, to summarize at this point, the islet in someone with type 2 diabetes, the, the, the thermostat that measures the blood sugar and regulates the blood sugar, is very abnormal. They've lost about... 60-70% of the cells that make insulin. And they've lost it through a process of programmed cell death called apoptosis. And that happens because it's a protein that is co-synthesized and co-secreted along with insulin, 20 million insulin molecules a day per cell, about 5 million IPP molecules per day per cell. In health, you make this protein, you fold it up, you secrete it out of the cell, and the cell does fine. If you work the cell too hard, plus you have the predisposition for diabetes, this protein misfolds inside the cell and forms these cylindrin-like structures in membranes, causes the membranes to dysfunction, to leak. Calcium leaks across the membranes, which is an area of important investigation right now, and the cell becomes abnormal, doesn't work very well, doesn't release insulin, and has an increased risk eventually of dying the material that's left behind accumulates in these big extracellular amyloid deposits out here. These aren't really what's causing the damage, at least in type 2 diabetes. That occurred inside the cells. And the, <coughs> the consequence then is you don't have enough insulin secretion. So unlike type 1 diabetes, where you lose all the beta cells very quickly from this immune attack, here you're gradually losing them through this protein misfolding. Similar process that's happening to hippocampal cells in the brain in Alzheimer's uh, disease. So let's return back to our, our risk factor list. So obesity and sedentary behavior and sleep disruption all tend to lead to being, you to be, if you have these, to be more resistant to insulin. You need more insulin per day. So the 20 million 
molecules per cell calculation is if you're insulin sensitive, if you're, if you're healthy. If you're overweight, it gets up to maybe 40 insulin molecules a day. Pregnancy is an adaptive state of insulin resistance short term. Uh, people with chronic liver disease likewise and glucocorticoids. And in these folks, there is a tendency to accumulate these proteins inside the cells if they have the predisposition. So I keep saying predisposition. What is the predisposition? So now I'm going to highlight um, three other investigators who either have been here or uh, are still here. Uh, Sharon DeVasker is the chair of pediatrics here at UCLA. And Sharon works on particularly the area of placental function, how, uh, how babies develop in the uterus in relation to how healthy the placenta is. And that is likely to be a very important component in this story. Sangeeta Darwin is here, did work with Anil Bhushan, who was here and is now at UCSF. And Sangeeta and Anil have taught us a tremendous amount about the epigenetic regulation of beta cells. Epigenetics, rather than um, or everything related to just the genes that you have in each cell, one of the key factors is which genes are turned on or off. And that speaks to the issue of epigenetics. And that is also, to some degree, related to something called imprinting. Um, and that's an area of active investigation by Sangeeta, who's still here, uh, and I think will actually be more important than epigenetics, but please don't tell Anil. <laughs> so let me show you, uh, I think, the only graph I'm going to show you. Um, and this is it. And this shows you a graph of the number of pancreatic beta cells at different age groups, newborn babies, age 1 to 5, 5 to 14 years, 14 to 18. And these are all human data. These, every one of these dots is a tragedy because, again, this is work Alex Butler did with a postdoc in the lab at the time, Uris Meyer. And we have a pancreas from each of these children that have sadly died of traumatic deaths generally. And we've been able to measure the number of beta cells they have. None of these have diabetes. It's to show you that in health, you're born with about 200 milligrams of beta cells and you grow to have about a gram by the time you're an adult. But the point I'm trying to make with this, for this purpose, is look at the range. This has been reproduced by others and also by us in monkeys and pigs. There's about a 10 to 15 fold range in the number of pancreatic beta cells amongst us in this room. Some of us are lucky enough to have two grams, some of us less lucky and maybe only have two or 300 milligrams. Tremendous range. And once you're an adult, that's it. You don't really change your number of beta cells very much. The reason this is likely to be important is based on the work that's been done here by Sharon DeVasco's group in collaboration in part with our group, with Anil, uh, Alexei Matvienko when he was here, the status of your fetal life when you were a fetus is one of the major things that dictates this. And in fact, Babies that are born with low birth weight because perhaps the placenta didn't work so well during, during uh, pregnancy have a markedly increased risk of diabetes in later life. So low birth weight babies is a big risk factor for type 2 diabetes later. Also for Alzheimer's disease, interestingly. And during that fetal period back here, the epigenetic regulation and imprinting of the subsequent growth of beta cells is set down. And a work of Anil Bhushan and Sangeeta Darwin has revealed and been published in the highest journals that this is extremely important in the transition of immature beta cells through the maturation phase here. So that you need not only a, a large number of beta cells as an adult, but you need them to work. And if the epigenetics is subtly wrong, then you can have what seem like plenty of beta cells, but unfortunately they're not very functional. So this is a very important area of work and it, the genetic, or the, it is the family history underpinning of diabetes. So diabetes has a strong family history. It's hereditary, but it's not classically genetic. The genome-wide association studies that have been done in millions of patients with type 2 diabetes versus non-diabetics can only account for about 5% of the risk of type 2 diabetes. So all the genes everyone's looked at through the whole chromosome system does not explain your risk of type 2 diabetes. So, so for those who are classical geneticists, this is not a genetic disease, and yet it's a hereditary disease. And that's where the epigenetics and probably the fetal programming 
lives. So that's going to be an area, I think, of active investigation is increasingly true of many chronic diseases. Very good. So I think I'm going to do what I'm always delighted when it happens and finish a lecture early. Hopefully you will all think the same way. I don't think anybody's ever complained when a lecture finishes early, but <laughs> any complaints? So we're getting near the end here. We've done the uh, family history and ethnicity. What about this one down here, persistent organic pollutants? What's that got to do with diabetes? Is that just a scare to try and make you buy organic food? Please buy Butler Industries. I've got this new company I'm just starting. <laughs> Free samples outside. No, not really. What are persistent organic pollutants? Um, this began in Vietnam with orange, Agent Orange. Some of you may be familiar with. We used it to, to uh, remove trees so we could see the bad guys. It turns out that some of the good guys got diabetes as a consequence of being exposed to it. And the, federal, the Veterans Administration compensates um, Vietnam War veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange and developed type 2 diabetes. Um, there is a chemical very similar to it that spilled into a river near Serrano in Italy uh, about 10 years ago. And two or three towns downstream, huge numbers of people developed diabetes within the next uh, weeks as a consequence of drinking the water from that river. The, <coughs> the persistent organic pollutants are defined by the fact that they don't break down readily. They're manufactured. They're not naturally occurring peptides or compounds. They're generally um, used as pesticides often, uh, sprayed onto crops. And unfortunately, because they're of their nature, when you wash them, your lettuce with water, they don't wash off. You have, you'd have to use soap or something like that to get them off. And in Spain, actually, they recommend you have a kind of detergent to wash your, your fruit and veg with. And the concern is that, that being persistent, they stay in the food chain. So fish increasingly have these persistent organic peptides in them. I think I read somewhere yesterday, in fact, in the New York Times, that 80% of seabirds now have been shown to have high levels of pers persistent organic peptides in them. And they're eating the same fish as we are. So if you look at the synthesis of synthetic, these, these persistent organic pesticides versus the prevalence of diabetes, it's a pretty scary correlation. So diabetes prevalence from 1940 to 2010 is the red curve going up. The, persistic, the chemical production of persistent organic peptides, uh, not peptide uh, chemicals, is the blue curve. That's a much better fit, by the way, than the obesity curve. So Two curves running together do not prove causality, but they certainly raise a question that needs to be looked at. And it turns out that the way these chemicals work is they tend to poison the parts of the cell that deal with misfolded proteins, something called a proteasome, something called autophagy. And these are the very pathways that are really important in long-lived cells, like your brain cells and your pancreatic beta cells, to protect you from uh, misfolded proteins. So, and when they're used as insect uh, insecticides, part of what they're doing is they're poisoning the animals by screwing up their ability to get rid of misfolded proteins. Well, it doesn't take a huge leap of understanding to think if it kills that critter that was going to eat the lettuce, and now I'm going to eat the lettuce, mm -hmm. you're probably going to eat more than one lettuce, and with time, there's a concern here. And <clears throat> if we now look at the available data on these persistent organic pollutants in people, which are best measured in fat biopsies. This is the US. This is body mass index. So these are skinny people. Body mass index is your weight in kilograms divided by your height squared. So basically, skinny, overweight, obese. So obesity going in this direction. And the prevalence of diabetes on the vertical scale. And then in this direction is how much in a fat biopsy of these most common six most common persistent organic pollutants were found. So interestingly, in this particular study, the obese individuals who had no uh, detectable organic pesticides did not have diabetes. Folks who, had, <coughs> who were skinny and had a lot of pesticide had quite a lot of diabetes. It was enough. And then they appear to compound. So if you had pesticide plus you're obese, more than 60% of them folks had diabetes. So is this just the US? No, it's been done in other countries. This very similar pattern here in Spain. It's been done in Finland. It's been done in Britain. So 
part of, I think, our westernization, our urbanization, is we live more and more off food that other people are producing in bulk for us. Those of you who drive through Ventura and see all those extraordinary plastic bags that are... Anybody know what that is, where there's a huge plastic bag and there's something growing underneath it? How much of this is underneath that plastic bag? And by the way, when you cover your food in cling film and stick it in the microwave, a whole bunch of this goes into your food. And when you cover your food in cling film and stick it in the fridge and get it back tomorrow, guess how much of this has now gone into your food? I'm not selling cling film, that's for sure. So, so <clears throat> to, to summarize then, <laughs> here's our list of things that, that we've sort of gone through that make you at risk of type 2 diabetes. So obesity, sedentary behavior, sleep disruption, pregnancy, chronic liver disease, too much alcohol glucocorticoids, these are all things that make you insulin resistant, but if you're lucky enough to choose the right parents, you don't get diabetes, right? Family history and ethnicity, a strong family history and ethnicity, it's not genetic, so that's wrong, it's epigenetic. It's not a genetic disease. You cannot find a gene that describes this very easily. There are a few, but very few. And then <clears throat> environment, persistent organic pollutants, sleep disruption, I think is very important. And it's a collision of these three, really, that together lead to an accumulative damage. And this very specific islet of Langerhan change, it's a disease, not just because you've eaten too much. And, <clears throat> you know, in that regard, I tell my patients with type 2 diabetes that this disease is a lot like male pattern baldness. It's hereditary. You know, no one blames James Bond for wearing the wrong hats when he was younger, right? This is something that just happens if you happen to have a family that happen to be the ones that are losing the cells. And I think of type 2 diabetes very much along these lines because society is urbanized. Society is using cling film. Society is driving on the 405 freeway. You know, we're all exposed to this stuff. It's not fair to I, my plea to the writer, the author of that first poster, don't blame individuals for what we're all doing to each other in society. Some individuals have this genetic or hereditary background and are predisposed to diabetes. This disease requires sympathy the same as any other, and you know, ultimately, we once we get good at making new beta cells through stem cell approaches, we will be able to reverse this disease just as well as we can reverse type 1 diabetes, because it's a disease of insufficient cells that make the hormone insulin. Uh, and that's, a, <coughs> I think, a, a mo something of hope for those of you who are here if you have either diabetes or family with it. So we come back to this little fellow. I don't think many of us want to go back to living that lifestyle. I mean, yeah, if we did, we wouldn't get much diabetes. But, you know, there's a lot of other reasons why you don't really want to dig out a little paddy field for your life. And so we're not going to put the genie back in the bottle lifestyle-wise, but there, I think there are practical things for those of you who parents can do. This is the uh, daily Facebook connection map around the world. You have a kid who's a teenager who's sitting with their laptop at 2 o'clock in the morning, Facebooking their friend. They're shutting off their pineal gland, shutting off their melatonin, screwing up their clocks, making themselves insulin resistant. I think we as parents, a lot of us have to realize we need to turn off the electronic devices once it gets dark. We need to read old-fashioned books, maybe we need to um, lead by example. It's easy to park kids in front of Facebook, right? It's easy to park them in front of the TV, but those, that blue light is a big deal. Um, in terms of public health, I think we as academics and development office and everybody, we need, to, we need to contribute to doing things that produce subways or ways that people aren't going to spend three or four hours of their life per day sitting in one of these tin boxes. It's, it's a major health issue. And collectively, I mean, if you come back to this gentleman again, you now see all the issues. He's sleep deprived. He's got all this blue light firing at him. He's sitting in a chair for his job, like I do when I'm seeing patients, like you do if you're sitting at a computer. He's probably got cravings for snacks as a result of all this and goes and gets those fast food, French fries, big, etc. This all adds together. So, coming back to my defacer, respectfully, I think it's more complicated than that. Respectfully, I think we actually need to be 
um, sympathetic to this issue, and I think we should show leadership in addressing it. And I think UCLA, with a fantastic School of Public Health and a great number of very smart academics, and I've shown you some of their pictures today, collectively, we can do something about this and should do. This is my preferred cartoon. This is from a diabetes educator for a magazine years ago, and the doctor is saying to the startled patient, it's partly glandular, and he's right, and it's partly 8,500 calories a day, and he's right. So folks, thank you for coming. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>